If you were to look at the sort of curriculum still being disseminated until quite recently, I mean 50 or 60 years ago, you would see that it was relatively brief. A few short sentences described what was to be studied in the different subjects each year. Such a curriculum covered at most two to four pages. All the rest in those days was left to the actual practice of teaching. The practice of teaching itself, out of its own needs and its own powers, was to stimulate the teachers to do what they should with the curriculum. Things are different today. The curriculum for secondary schools has swollen to the proportions of a book called Official Document. It stipulates not only what must be achieved, but also contains all sorts of instructions on how to do things in school. <clears throat> in recent decades, we have been allowing education to be swallowed by state legislation. Perhaps it is the dream of many a legislator eventually to reintroduce everything that used to be contained in the old literature on education as official publications and decrees. Socialist leaders certainly have this intent in their subconscious. Today they are embarrassed to say this openly, but it is certainly there in the subconscious. Their ideal is to regulate what, until a short while ago, belonged to the domain of free culture, even in the sphere of education. Consequently, those of us who want to preserve the educational system and teaching from its collapse under Lenin, which could spread to Central Europe, must approach our understanding of curriculum in quite a different way. Our stance toward the so-called official document must be different from that of ordinary teachers. They have taken it very seriously both under the monarchy and during the era of ordinary democratic parliamentarianism. But they will view it with particular, particularly servile feelings once it is sent to them by their dictatorial comrades. The tyranny inherent in socialism would be felt with particular strength in the realm of teaching and education. We must view the curriculum in a very different way. Our approach has been such that we must put ourselves in the position of being able to create it ourselves at any moment. We must be able to read from the seventh through tenth years of childhood what we ought to do during these years. Tomorrow we shall juxtapose the ideal curriculum with what is now most prevalent in other Central European schools. We can prepare ourselves thoroughly for the concluding remarks by getting a feeling for all that must be absorbed before we can understand the curriculum. There is another exceptionally important aspect that is rather misjudged in today's official educational circles. At the close of my previous lecture, I spoke about the morality of education. Footnote. See lecture 14 in the Foundations of Human Experience. End of footnote. The morality of education must be practiced in our class lessons, but this becomes actual practice in the classroom only when we avoid many of the examples provided by books on education. Such books speak about object lessons. There is nothing inherently wrong with these, and we have discussed how to conduct such lessons. Again and again, however, we have had to stress that they must never be allowed to become trivial and that they should never exceed a certain limit. The eternal cross-examination of the students on obvious matters in object lessons spreads an unnecessary cloud of boredom over the lessons. It deprives the lessons of the very element I stressed as being so important at the end of my lecture an hour ago, the development of the children's imaginative capacity. Footnote. See Lecture 14 in the Foundations of Human Experience, and footnote. <clears throat> Speaking comparatively, if you discuss with your students the shape of a saucepan by way of an object lesson, you will undermine their imaginative faculty. You will do better, you will do much better than what passes today as an object lesson if you discuss with them the shape of a Grecian urn and leave them to use their own soul forces to carry these thoughts over to an understanding of an ordinary cooking pot. Object lessons, as they are given today, often literally stifle the imagination. It is not at all a bad idea to leave a good deal unsaid in teaching, so that the children are induced to engage their soul forces with what they have absorbed during lessons. It is not at all beneficial to explain everything in the lesson down to the last dot on the eye. When you do this, the children leave school with the feeling that they have learned everything already and begin to look for some form of mischief. If, on the other hand, you plant seeds for their imagination, they remain interested in what was offered during the lessons and are, that, and are less inclined to seek out mischief. That our children today turn into such troublemakers is solely because we give them too much of the wrong sort of object lesson and too little appropriate training for their feelings and will. 
there is still another way in which it is necessary for our souls to become intimately linked with the curriculum. When children come to you during the early years of school, they are quite different beings from the same children at the ages of 13 through 15. During these years, children are very much bodily beings. They are still very much immersed in their bodies. When the time comes for them to leave school at the age of 14 or 15, you must have implanted in them the capacity no longer to cling to the body with all the fibers of the soul, but to be independent of their bodies in thinking, feeling, and willing. If you try to immerse yourselves somewhat more profoundly in the nature of the growing human being, you will find that during the early school years children still possess relatively healthy instincts, particularly if they have not been spoiled. In these years children do not yet have such a craving to stuff themselves with sweets and such. They still have certain healthy instincts with regard to food, just as an animal has very good instincts with regard to food because it is completely immersed in its body. The animal avoids what is bad for it. It is certainly an exception in the animal world for an evil to spread in the way alcohol has spread in the wor world of human beings. The spread of such evils as alcohol is due solely to the fact that human beings are spiritual beings and, and can become so independent of their physical natures. The physical body is far too sensible ever to be tempted to become an alcoholic. Relatively healthy instincts with respect to food still live in children during the early school years. For the sake of the individual's development, these impulses fade away at the ages of 13 to 15. When puberty finally overtakes children, they lose their good instincts with regard to food. They have to replace, they have to replace with reason what their intuition gave them in earlier years. This is why you can intercept, as it were, the last manifestations of the growing child's instincts about food and health at the ages of 13 to 15. You can still just catch the tail end of a healthy regard for food, for growth, and so on. Later you can no longer reach an inner feeling for proper nutrition and health care. In these years the children must receive instruction on nutrition and health care for the human being. This is the proper subject for object lessons. Object lessons can support the imaginative faculty very well. Show the children or remind them that such things exist, for they will have seen them before, a substance that, contain, that consists mainly of starch or sugar, one that is chiefly fat, and another composed mainly of protein. The children know these differences, but remind them that it is generally from these three ingredients that the activity of the human organism proceeds. Taking this as your point of departure, you can explain to the children the mysteries of nutrition. Then you can exactly describe the breathing process and develop for them concepts related to the care of the human being's health through nutrition and breathing. You will gain enormous benefits in terms of your teaching by instructing them in this way during these years, for you will intercept the last manifestations of the instinct for what is health-giving and nutritious. <clears throat> you can teach children about conditions of nutrition and health at this time without making them egotistic for the whole of their later life. It is still natural for children of this age to fulfill their health and nutritional needs instinctively. Accordingly, you can speak about the subject and what you say will be met by an innate understanding that is natural to human beings and does not make them egotistic. If children are not taught about the conditions of health and nutrition at this time, they have to inform themselves later by reading or from information others give them. The knowledge that comes to people after puberty, by whatever means, with regard to the conditions of nutrition and health, produces egotism in them. It is entirely unavoidable. If you read about nutritional physiology, if you read a summary of the rules of health care, you become more egotistic than you were. It is inherent in the very nature of the subject. The egotism that originates and I become acquainted through reason with the way we have to take care of ourselves must be fought with morality. If we did not have to care for ourselves physically, we should need no morality in our souls. But people are less exposed to the dangers of egotism later in life if they are taught about nutrition and health care at the age of 13 or 14, when such instruction does not yet make for egotism, but supports what is natural to the human being. You see to what a degree the very questions of life are embedded in the right moment for teaching different subjects to human beings. You make provision for the whole of life if you teach the human being the right things at the proper time. It would be best of all if we could teach the seven and eight-year-olds about nutrition and health care, 
Then they would absorb this knowledge in the most selfless way, because they still hardly know what it refer- that it refers to them. <coughs> they would regard themselves as an object and not as a subject. But they cannot understand enough at that age. Their power of judgment has not developed sufficiently for them to understand. Consequently, we cannot teach the subjects of nutrition and health care in these early years. We must save these subjects for when children reach the age of 13 or 14. This is the age when the fire of their instinct for nutrition and health is beginning to fade, but when the presence of the capacity to comprehend compensates for the fading of this intuition. With older children there will be every opportunity to mention, almost as an aside, many things that relate to health and nutrition, in natural history, in physics, in lessons that expand on geography, even in history. You will see that it is not necessary to include these two as subjects in the timetable. Much in the lessons must live in a way that enables us to let it mingle with the other subjects we teach. If we have an understanding of what the children ought to be taking in, then they themselves, or the whole community of children gathered in the school, will tell us daily what we ought to be including by way of interspersed remarks in our lessons. They will let us know how we have to develop a certain presence of mind just because we are teachers. If we have been drilled as subject teachers of geography or history, we will not develop this presence of mind, for our aim will be to teach nothing but history from the beginning of the history lesson to the end. In this circumstance, exceptionally unnatural conditions are created. Their damaging effects on life have not been fully considered as yet. It is an intimate truth that we benefit human beings. We do something that prevents egotism from developing excessively if we teach them about nutrition and health care at the age of 13 or 14 in the way I have described to you. Many things can permeate with feeling the whole way we teach our lessons. If you attach a feeling element wherever you can to your subject matter, what you want to achieve in your teaching remains with the students for the rest of their lives. If you teach only what appeals to reason and intellect when the children between 13 and 15, not much will remain with them later. Let me read that again. If you teach only what appeals to reason and intellect when the children are between 13 and 15, not much will remain with them later. Accordingly, it must be your intention to permeate with feeling in your own being whatever you impart in an imaginative way during these years. You must try to present geography, history, and natural history in a vivid and graphic way that is nonetheless filled with feeling. To the imaginative element must be added the feeling element. With regard to the curriculum, the time between the ages of 7 and 14 or 15 does indeed fall clearly into the three divisions outlined here. Up to the age of 9 we teach the growing child mainly the conventional subjects, writing and reading. Up to the age 12 we continue the more conventional subjects as well as subjects based on the human power of judgment. As you have seen, we study the animal and plant kingdoms, because at this age children still have a certain instinctive sense of the relationships that play into these realms. I have shown you during our lectures on teaching methods how you should convey an idea of the relationship of the human being to the whole world of nature, cuttlefish, mouse, lamb, and human being. Footnote, see discussion 8 in Discussions with Teachers. End of footnote. We have also made a great effort, which I hope will not be in vain, for it will bear flowers and fruit during the botany lessons, to impart a sense of the human being's relationship to the plant world. These subjects should be elaborated through mental pictures filled with feeling during the middle period of a child's life, while an innate understanding of the animals and plants is still present. This is the time when human beings easily experience themselves at one moment to be cats, and at the next wolves, lions, or eagles, even if not with the ordinary light of reasoning consciousness. <clears throat> Children still have this feeling of being first one creature and then another until just after the age of nine. Before that age it is stronger, but they cannot penetrate it because the necessary power for understanding it does not exist. If children are very precocious and talk about themselves a great deal at the age of four or five, they will frequently compare themselves to eagles, mice, and so on. But if, in their ninth year, we set about teaching children natural history in the way we have indicated, we will still encounter a wealth of related instinctive feeling in them. Later, this instinct matures to the point where they also have an understanding of being related to the plant world. 
Consequently, we, we first teach the natural history of the animal kingdom and then the natural history of the plant kingdom. We reserve the minerals until the last because to understand the minerals requires <clears throat> almost nothing but the power of judgment and this effort does not call upon anything through which the human being is related to the outside world. The human being is not related to the mineral kingdom. More than any other, it is the mineral kingdom that we must dissolve, as I have shown you. Found footnote 4, see Foundations of Human Experience, Lecture 12. Human beings do not even tolerate salt that is not dissolved in the organism. As soon as they take it in, they have to dissolve it. It lies very much within the nature of the human being to arrange the curriculum in the manner suggested. There is a beautiful balance in the, this middle period, from the ages of 9 to 11, between instinctive capacities and the power of judgment. We can always be sure that the child will meet us with understanding if we count on a certain instinctive comprehension and if we do not describe things too graphically, particularly in natural history and botany. We must avoid external analogies, particularly with reference to the plant world, for this really goes against the grain of natural feeling. Natural feeling is in itself predisposed to seek qualities of soul in plants, not the external physical form of the human being in this or that tree, but soul relationships, such as we have just tried to discover in the plant system. The actual power of judgment that lets us count on reasoned intellectual understanding belongs to the last of the three periods of childhood. That is why we use the twelfth year when the child is moving toward an understanding based on judgment to let this power of judgment merge with what still requires a kind of instinct, even though it is already strongly overshadowed by the power of judgment. Here we find the twilight instincts of the soul that have to be overcome by the power of judgment. <coughs> We must take into account that during this stage the human being has an innate sense for the calculation of interest rates, for what can be raked in as profit, for the principle of discount, and so on. This information appeals to the instincts, but we must let the power of judgment be much stronger. During this period we must deal with the relationships that exist among the element of calculation, the circulation of commodities, and the ownership of property and wealth. In other words, we must concern ourselves with percentage and interest calculations, discount calculations, and similar matters. It is exceedingly important that we do not teach the children these concepts too late. If we do, it means that we can count only on their egoism. We do not deal with egoism if, toward age 12, we begin to teach them about concepts of monetary transactions and commerce. Actual bookkeeping can be addressed later. It involves more reasoning. To teach them these concepts at this age is very important for them because the inner selfish feelings for interest rates, bonds, and so on are not yet stirring in children who are so young. When they are older and enter business schools, such concepts become rather more serious. Such are the elements of teaching that you must take to heart. Try not to overdo, for instance, when you are describing the plants, particularly in plant lessons, you should try to teach in a way that leaves a great deal to the children's imagination so that out of their own feelings they can imaginatively form the soul connections between the human soul and the plant world. <clears throat> Those teachers who wax too enthusiastic about object lessons simply do not know that the human being also has to be taught about things that are not visible externally. <clears throat> and if by means of object lessons we try to teach human beings particular subjects that we ought to teach through working on them in a moral and feeling way, we do them actual harm. We must not forget that mere observation and demonstration of things is very much a byproduct of the materialistic views of our age. Of course, observation should be cultivated in its proper place, but it is wrong to transform into observation what is more suitably imparted through a moral and feeling influence working from teacher to student. I believe that you have now taken in enough to make it possible for us to form our curriculum. That is the end of Lecture 14. However, there is a slight addendum that I will read. Uh, this is from the editor. With this, Rudolf Steiner ended these lectures. On the following day, he gave three lectures on the appropriate curriculum and outlined the goals of teaching in various subjects for students of different ages. Footnote, the lectures on curriculum are included in discussions with teachers. He pointed out the subjects that might be connected in the, in the way they are presented. 
At the end of those lectures, Steiner made the following concluding remarks. Today I would like to conclude these discussions by pointing out something I want to lay upon your hearts. I would like you to stick firmly to the following four principles. First, teachers must make sure that they influence and work on their students in a broader sense by allowing the spirit to flow through their whole being as teachers, and also in the details of their work, how each word is spoken and how each concept or feeling is developed. Teachers must be people of initiative. They must be filled with initiative. Teachers must never be careless or lazy. They must at every moment stand in full consciousness of what they do in the school and how they act toward the children. This is the first principle. The teacher must be a person of initiative in everything done, great and small. <clears throat> Second, my dear friends, we as teachers must take an interest in everything happening in the world and in whatever concerns humankind. All that is happening in the outside world and in human life must arouse our interest. It would be deplorable if we as teachers were to shut ourselves off from anything that might interest human beings. We should take an interest in the affairs of the outside world, and we should also be able to enter into anything, great or small, that concerns every single child in our care. That is the second principle. The teacher should be one who is interested in the being of the whole world and of humanity. Third, the teacher must be one who never compromises in the heart and mind with what is untrue. Teachers must be true in the depths of their being. Teachers must never compromise with untruth, because if they did, we would see how untruth would find its way through many channels into our teaching, especially in the way we present the subjects. Our teaching will only bear the stamp of truth when we ardently strive for truth in ourselves. <clears throat> and now comes something more easily said than done. But it is nevertheless also a golden rule for the teacher's calling. The teacher must never get stale or grow sour. Cherish a mood of soul that is fresh and healthy. No getting stale and sour. This must be the teacher's endeavor. And I know, my dear friends, that if during these two weeks you have properly received into your inner life what we were able to shed light on from the most diverse viewpoints, then indirectly through the realms of feeling and will, what may still seem remote will come closer to your souls as you work with the children in the classroom. During these two weeks I have spoken only of what can enter directly into your practical teaching when you first allow it to work properly within your own souls. But our Walder School, my dear friends, will depend on what you do within yourselves and whether you really allow the things we have considered to become effective in your own souls. Think of the many things I have tried to clarify in order to come to a psychological view of the human being, especially of the growing human being. Remember these things. And maybe there will be moments when you feel unsure about how or when to bring one thing or another into your teaching or where to introduce it. <clears throat> but if you remember properly what has been presented during these two weeks, then thoughts will surely arise in you that will tell you what to do. Of course, many things should really be said many times, but I do not want to make you into teaching machines, but into free, independent teachers. Everything spoken of during the past two weeks was given to you in the same spirit. The time has been so short that for the rest I must simply appeal to the understanding and devotion you will bring to your work. Turn your thoughts again and again to all that has been said that can lead you to understand the human being and especially the child. It will help you in all the many questions of method that may arise. When you look back in memory to these discussions, then our thoughts will certainly meet again in all the various impulses that have come to life during this time. For myself, I can assure you that I will also be thinking back to these days, because right now this Waldorf school is indeed weighing heavily on the minds of those taking part in its beginning and organization. This Waldorf school must succeed. Much depends on its success. Its success will bring a kind of proof of many things in the spiritual evolution of humankind that we must represent. In conclusion, if you will allow me to speak personally for a moment, I would like to say, for me, this Waldorf school will be a veritable child of concern. Again and again I will have to come back to this Waldorf school with anxious, caring thoughts. But when we keep in mind the deep seriousness of the situation, we can really work well together. Let us especially keep before us the thought which will truly fill our hearts and minds, that connected with the present-day spiritual movement are also the spiritual powers that guide the cosmos. When we believe in these good spiritual powers, they will inspire our lives, and we 
will truly be able to teach.